Good morning and welcome to the CFA Society South Africa Annual Conference for 2018. Thank you Cape Town for having us. We've got an exciting lineup for you today. I'm looking forward to an interactive day. The theme of our conference, it is building on the call to action that CFA is placing on us as investment professionals to say, Let's stand up and be counted. Let's take responsibility for what we do and how we do it. And we look forward to a range of speakers setting the scene for us on that today. So I'm going to hand over to Ziona Jacobs next, who's going to be our opening address this morning. Now, Ziona wears many hats. And um, we are having her here today, I guess, in the capacity of two particular hats that she wears. Although her day job is as Director of Corporate Affairs and Marketing at the JSE, um, Ziona is also on the um, executive of ASEA, the African Stock Exchanges Association. And a year ago, CFA Institute and ASEA signed a memorandum of understanding to really take hands and work together to promote the integrity of the markets, the financial markets in Africa, and work together to make this realize. Ziona also until recently was the chairperson of COSI, the Committee of Sub-Saharan Stock Exchanges, and in that capacity also she plays an instrumental role across Sub-Saharan Africa in terms of our financial markets, putting in place the things that are necessary to build not on the integrity but also on the capacity of African financial markets. So, Ziona, thank you very much. It's wonderful having you here with us. We look forward to hearing from you. Over the years, digital disruption has brought many significant change to the investment industry. Firms have benefited from more streamlined, digitized processes, electronic auditing, to improve accountability and governance. But with customers able to conduct most of their transactions from their smartphones, they are demanding increasing control of their financial destinies. Disintermediation is occurring across financial sectors, and customers are increasingly demanding up-to-date market information and analytics. Still, how many would be willing to fly without an investment pilot? Today, I invite you to consider how, as the investment industry, can we remain relevant in an ever-changing, digitized VUCA world? together with how we assess the way in which we can leverage South Africa's world-class financial regulatory systems and financial markets to broaden the impact of our work in society at large. It is worth remembering that the core purpose of the investment industry lies in two overlapping areas, wealth creation and savings and investments. As an April 2017 report of the CFA Institute on the future state of, investment of the investment profession points out, wealth creation is about mobilizing capital for jobs and growth and the capital in the chain creates wealth and well-being. On the savings and investment front, the report outlines that deploying investment services for wealth and risk management allows for increased wealth. Our country and our continent is changing rapidly, demographically, politically, socioeconomically. The fragile socioeconomic balance, which many African countries are striving to achieve, not only underpinned by growth, but that we are creating jobs and bringing more people into the formal economy. And we need to create support for the informal economy. I don't think that there is such thing as a scientific method. I think that there are different methods and different methodologies in science. And if you look at the history of thinking about this, it's quite clear that there are different definitions of scientific method. Right back from Plato, who said, science is about discovering the mind of God, and we can examine objects to discover the forms of those objects of which things in reality are merely lower 
lower, you know, lower standard instantiations of the mind of God, which is a real thing science should understand. Aristotle, and then much later, Francis Bacon, said, no, science is about empirical observation and explaining things. It's about looking at what's in the world and creating a taxonomy for what we see. Galileo said, we must theorize, and then we must observe and see whether our theories are confirmed by our observations. Newton said we must have experiments. We can create uh, ideas, and then we need to go out experiment and test those ideas. Werewell was a very important but lesser known uh, scientist who said we have the hypothetico-deductive method. We have a hypothesis, and we deduce the consequences of that hypothesis, and then we go and see whether these consequences are actually in the world. Very influential in economics. John Stuart Mill said, hang on, induction can be okay. We want to go out and observe regularities. And John Stuart Mill came up with the ideas of laws of nature. And those are things where invariably one cause leads to a, a consequent. And that always happens. When a snooker ball, when the cue ball hits the other snooker ball, it always moves. That is a law of nature. We don't need to have a theory about it. We don't need to explain why this happens, but we can have these laws and observations, which Mill said was okay as a means of knowledge. And I'm going to talk a bit about what Mill said about economics as well in a moment. So we had logical positivism. We had falsificationism. We had scientific anarchy. I'm going to talk a little bit about. We've had feminist science. We're now in this great city as a world leader on post-colonial science, which is actually become a very serious debate in philosophy of science, and Marxist science, and many other kinds of science, many other kinds of debates about the way science works. So the positive science function is the only part, I think, of finance that has a proper methodology. It says we build models that explain things. We test those models through logical coherence. A model has to be a logically coherent system. It can't contain contradictions itself. We then look at how those models explain data and explain things we see in the world. Model in a wind tunnel of our financial system and our financial institutions. And that's where we make a mistake. So the practical implications, I'm finally there. Enough of this philosophy and methodology stuff, right? So the financial crisis, was this a Tacoma Bridge problem? Were our models working in theory but not in practice. When we regulated the banking system by using value at risk models and we set risk budgets, would that have survived the wind tunnel, whatever the equivalent of a wind tunnel in finance would be? We kind of have learned some of these lessons now, right? So now central banks do stress tests, sort of. And stress tests are kind of analogous to a wind tunnel, a testing model. Uh, but also not, because a stress test is only as good as the inputs you put into it. We also can do small-scale experiments. So there is a field called experimental economics, which largely consists in taking undergrad students and putting them in little marketplaces and seeing how they behave when they trade with each other. Some of that is, is kind of useful, but uh, it's very hard to understand what is analogous in that little schoolroom uh, marketplace to the real marketplaces. But we can do things such as small-scale implementations of a market to see how it works before we do large-scale implementations. When we come to understand the foundations of the financial system, we might come to see what parts of it are changeable and what parts are not. Will the next revolution happen when we truly switch from Knightian risk to Knightian uncertainty? What is that? There was an economist who I think should be much more famous than any of the other economists I've spoken about, called Frank Knight, in the 1920s in America, uh, who wrote a book called Risk, Profit, and Uncertainty, who said there are two different things, two different kinds of risk. One is the predictable risk, and he, he used the example of a champagne production line that you know that four out of every hundred bottles are going to be dropped and smashed in your production line. So you start off by targeting 104 bottles. That kind of risk we can manage. And in a perfectly competitive market, there's no profit to be made because everybody will manage that risk into the system. But what if your uh, 
production line is hit by bolts of lightning and burns down. That kind of risk can't be managed. That's uncertainty. And Knight said that uncertainty is the source of profit in economic systems. That's the only thing that isn't going to be priced into perfectly competitive markets. And I think that our financial markets really work, and the profit that's made in financial markets comes from uncertainty, not from risk. But everything we've done in modern portfolio theory is based on that first conception of risk, that idea of the measurable form of risk. Now, here is a quote that I'm just going to leave you with. This is David Aikman at the Bank of England. And the Bank of England has done really interesting work on this, on how do we break the paradigm of financial market theory when regulating a financial system. So he's responsible for developing macroprudential framework at the Bank of England. And he says, the central premise that the distinction between risk and uncertainty is crucial has received far too little attention from the economics and finance professions to date. The shift is kind of like a paradigm shift. From risk to uncertainty can turn what we think we know about decision making upside down. Decision rules that attempt to achieve ever greater precision can be, become increasingly imprecise. Rules that attempt to weight optimally all the relevant information can sometimes generate poorer results than those based on simple averages or those that deliberately disregard information. Taking uncertainty seriously forces us to recognize that in some circumstances, there are potential benefits to more simplicity over greater complexity. These guys are thinking very hard about how to break the paradigm. And I work globally, and I see this time and time again. Firstly, most organizations kick the whole whistleblown conversation into the margins. I get it. It's like an emotional hot potato. Who wants a whistleblower in their organization? Not many. And nobody wakes up one morning and says, you know what, today I'm going to become a whistleblower. This is one of my aspirations. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. So I'm reflecting on whistleblowing processes. And when I was coming here on the plane from the UK, of course, you pull out the health and safety uh, pamphlet. And look at the pictures there, guys. It all makes out that if you're thundering towards the Atlantic Ocean with the back of the plane on fire, you very calmly pull the oxygen down, <laughs> you put it over your face, and then you remember to remove your high heels. <laughs> because you're thinking very calmly, right? And you go down the slide into the ocean. And this is how people talk about whistleblowing. So when organizations say, we've got a fantastic hotline, guys. This is all you need to do. This is the process that you follow. Without realizing that they're not keeping it real. So actually, in terms of the uh, airplane analysis, I think this is more likely to happen. And perhaps we never get to know that because if it crashes to the earth, how do we know? But I know certainly from my own experience as a whistleblower for LeisureNet that when you blow the whistle, you're met with psychological conflict. It's not something that comes easily to anybody. I loved my job at LeisureNet. I was there for nine years, and I loved the people that I worked for. I didn't want to get anybody into trouble. My purpose was to stop an unethical practice. So when we talk about whistleblowing, understand that a lot of the processes leave out the human content, the human liability, the human cost, and the organizational cost as well. So just to remind those young people that don't remember LeisureNet Limited, the health and racket clubs, we were known as the darling of the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. And institutional shareholders couldn't wait to fill their boots with our share. We were much loved. And in the year 2000, we were poised to list on the London Stock Exchange. And that was a big deal for South, African, for South Africa, because we were going to prove to the world that we could, do, we could actually equal 
what the rest of the world was doing by listing on the London Stock Exchange and selling our share. So here are some of the, the headlines that came out of global media, the global media there. Um, and they, they may be very similar to the headlines that are coming out of Steinhoff right now. And I only wish that I could have been part of some of your journey between 2000 and today. So again, just to reflect on it's so important for me to be here today. Of course, front and center to all of this was me as the whistleblower. Now, I was the international corporate treasurer in the company, and I reported directly into the joint CEOs, who were Peter Gardner and Rod Mitchell. So, in fact, our executive team, of which I was the only woman, we reported into the board, but via the joint CEOs. And it was very pleasing for me to know that I was the only woman on the South Africa, on the, on the male team, and a lot of women in the audience today, and globally really, will be thinking quietly to themselves, well, I'm a woman and I can never get my voice heard. But being a woman on a mainly male executive team gives you empowerment, it gives you more permission to speak out because you are the diverse member on that team. And this is why diversity is very, very important and critical for people to be able to speak up, not just about unethical practices, but also about innovative ideas. Surely organizations want to hear the voices of those people that offer pro-organizational voice. You would think, right? But often people that do speak up are met with a defensive shutdown and those people that can't listen up become gatekeepers of really serious issues. I really do think it strikes a chord with people uh, to think about, well, well what, what's really driving our markets today? Uh, and it's particularly, I think, important for uh, CFA practitioners, charter holders, because you know, we have to live in the real world and we are all responsible for other people's money. And, and that's, that's, that's an important responsibility because we've got to figure out well, what really works. And, and, and that's what I want to talk about today. And I've, I've titled this, yes, it's about game theory and history, but I've titled it Investing in the Fake News Age. Because the, the, the strand that's going to go through this talk is that by fake news, I don't mean people presenting a, a counterfeit piece of news, staging something, oh, that, that happens. What I mean by fake news is the presentation of opinion as fact. And I think that once you start looking at what we are bombarded with day in, day out, not just on you know, the, the political news, but also the news and information in our business, the business of financial management, financial services, so much of it is what I like to call fiat news. Again, the presentation of opinion as fact, the creation of a narrative, a story about how we should invest. For the last nine years, Quality as a factor has been absolutely, completely useless in your portfolios. All right, so the, 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 the green line here, the top line, we all re recognize that. That's the S&P 500. The starting date is March 2009 when the Federal Reserve started its QE program, buying of financial assets, soon to be adopted by every central bank or every major central bank around the world. And of course, we're all familiar with this story, that in the intervening nine years, the S&P 500 has tripled. Um, sorry, it's quadruple, it's quadruple, it's up 300%. It's been a quadruple. Right? That's the S&P 500. That blue line on the bottom, that's an investable index that Deutsche Bank puts out. It's their market neutral quality index. Right? What, what, what's that all about? Well, it's, it, tries to identify quality attributes, what we would ordinarily think of as quality. A uh, thousand large cap companies around the world, it evaluates them on return on invested capital, return on equity, accounting accruals. You know, so it's a decent proxy for what we think of as quality. And it's market neutral, so it goes long, equally weighted, the top 20%, the top 200 of those companies, and by top meaning the ones that score highest on these metrics, and it goes short the bottom 20%, the bottom 200, trying to isolate that quality factor. 
As you can see, that quality factor over the last nine years, it's not up 3% or 2.6% a year. That's a total, a total of 2.6% over nine years. Right? It's been as flat of a flat line as you can have in our business. And that is why every investor, and I dare say it's everyone in this room, because it certainly is me, everyone with a bias towards quality, we want to own the companies that have a strong management team, a fortress balance sheet, growing earnings, and we want to avoid or short the ones that don't. Right? Everyone with that bias, everyone in that room with that bias has had disappointing portfolios for the last nine years. And everyone in this room knows that that's the truth. Now, it doesn't mean that your quality stocks haven't gone up over the last nine years. Everything's gone up over the last nine years. My point is that the quality stocks in your portfolio haven't gone up because of their quality nests. In other words, the crappy companies in your portfolio have gone up just as much. Quality has not worked. So my question is, right, how does a market run without quality? Now part of the answer, I think, I'm confident in saying, is what I'll describe as the mechanistic effect of central banks buying $20 trillion, that's trillion with a T, worth of stuff. Right, so since March of, of 2009, actually we start this, this chart a little bit earlier, that blue line, that's the composite, the sum total of the big four central banks in the world. The US Federal Reserve, the European ECB, the Bank of Japan, and the Bank of China. Right, and so you can see that they're, they're the sum total of the balance sheets of those central banks has gone from like $6 billion now, and now it's well over $20 trillion, $20 trillion. That has an impact, right? And, it, and, it's, and it, this is the avowed impact that central bankers want to have when they buy stuff, right? When they expand their balance sheet. The goal is to raise the prices of all financial assets, right? And of course, the Fed, the ECB, the Bank of Japan, the Bank of China, they don't care about quality, right? They're not trying to reward the good companies and punish the bad. They want a rising tide to lift all boats, right? So absolutely just this wall of money that's been in markets, new money that's just printed out of what, you know, Jim Grant calls, you know, the thin alpine air, you know, the, 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 the Swiss National Bank is one of the largest shareholders of Apple. And, and where did the Swiss get that money, right? They just turned the printing press to generate Swiss francs. Right, which they then used to buy Apple stock. Uh, there's absolutely a mechanistic effect there. But what I, what I want to suggest to you is that this is only part of the story. It's only part of the story, the actual impact, the mechanistic impact of buying stuff. And that as effective, and in fact I think even more effective today, is what central bankers call communication policy. That is, the words, the forward guidance, as they call it, that they provide to investors to, make, to, to, to try to change our behavior. And look, this is not some tinfoil hat conspiracy idea. Right? So Ben Bernanke, on his last speech as Fed chair, he came out and said, well, you know, look, I've, I've had a pretty tough run of it here the last four years, uh, and I'm going to you know, hand over the reins to Janet Yellen. I, I, I got to tell you, when I look back, it's amazing what people tell you in their in going away speech, right? You know, so, so George Washington famously said, well, you know, don't get any alliances with Europe. Well, don't do that, right? And you know, Dwight Eisenhower, the U.S. president, his last speech, he said, oh, my God, watch out for the military-industrial complex. You know, when, when Dwight Eisenhower is warning you about the military-industrial complex, well, you know, that's something. So Bernanke is no exception. In his last speech, he says, look, well, you know, when, when the Great Recession hit, what did we do? Well, you know, the first thing we did, we took interest rates down to zero. That was our, our playbook. And we did that, and we needed to do more. So we had to come up with a whole new set of tools, and that set of tools was quantitative easing, buying stuff. And he said, and I, I agree with him entirely, this, that, that the, the, the buying we did in March 2009 
Yeah, I, I think it kind of saved the world, and I, I think he's absolutely right. But where he's also right is that QE2 really didn't do anything. And by the time the Fed got into QE3 and QE infinity, it was actually working against the purposes of what the Fed was trying to achieve. And so Bernanke said, so, well, we had to come up with a third toolkit. And that toolkit, he said, we call it communication policy. Some people also call it forward guidance. It was developed in committee by Janet Yellen. What is it? It is the use of our words, not to describe what we actually think about the world, but to try to change investor behavior. You know, what we might call lying in other circumstances. <laughs> right? And, and, and Bernanke goes on in his speech, he didn't, he didn't say the lying part, that was, that was my editorialization, but he, he, he goes on in the speech to say, look, this toolkit has been more successful than we could have ever imagined. More successful than we could ever imagine. This is why, now you can't go a day without some Fed governor, you know, giving a speech on CNBC or an interview on CNBC or, a, you know, giving a talk to the Journal or the FT or some, someone like that. It's, it's, it's why, this is why they do it. Right? To, to, to try to change our behavior, the behavior of everyone in this room, to train us to go and do what they want to do, which is to buy stuff, which is to buy. And uh, you know, I've, I've got the, these pictures here of, of, of these guys you know, pointing their finger, because in, in, there's, a, there's, there's game theory around this. Right? So in, in game theory, we call it the common knowledge game. And the, the common knowledge game is how do we, how do we train a crowd like investors, right? And, and the way you do it, you have to have a missionary. And what the missionary does, they stand on a stage like this in front of a camera like that. And what a missionary does is he or she will shake his or her finger at you, right? I got all these pictures by, I typed in, you know, name plus finger pointing. And, you know, you get these, these, these images come out, right? And so, so what, it, what, what, what a politician or a banker is doing when they stand on stage and they shake their finger at you is they're not telling you the facts, right? They're not delivering news. What they're doing is they're telling you how to think about the facts, right? So it's not telling you what to think, it's telling you how to think. And it's such a powerful thing. It's such a powerful thing because it's, it's one thing for someone, you know, so Draghi's giving his press conference today, right? It's one thing for him to say, well, you know, inflation was blah, blah, blah in the past quarter. Okay, that, that's, that's, that's a fact, right? But what's presented as news, and this is what I mean by fiat news, news that's created, the presentation of opinion as fact, is that you can watch, you know, I'm sure on your, your Bloomberg, you know, accounts right now, you've got some interpretation of Draghi's words in his press conference, where he shakes his finger at you and he's telling you about the central bank's intentions, what they intend to do about tapering the spending or what he thinks about the strength of the euro or, or, or any of that, right? It's his words that are being described to us as, oh, that's how we should think about the world. Right, so, so these are kind of the three of the, the robber barons uh, from, you know, before and during U.S. World War I. You've got Andrew Carnegie, you've got Jay Gould, he cornered the gold market in the 1870s. Uh, the Commodore, Cornelius Vanderbilt. What, what I find so interesting is that when you read the memoirs of famous investors and the people invested alongside them, anyone before World War II, you know, and you read what it meant to be on Wall Street an investor. No one, and I mean no one, will talk to you about modeling free cash flows. Right? None, none of the materials that you're going to read in your, your, your CFA curriculum are what these guys thought about in building their fortunes at all. Not at all. Right? What they are talking about, without exception, what Wall Street meant was the game of creating stories, what they would call corners. We still have the expression to corner the market, right? What that meant was you create a story which moves everyone in the market in one direction or another, and you're set up then to change the story and go the other way. That, 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 was, that, was, the, that was what it meant to be an investor. Now, look, I, I, I'm not saying those, these fundamentals aren't important. They are. 
right? But this was also important. And, and we can talk about lots of reasons why this developed after World War II. I'll call it the, the, the scientificization of finance and markets and investing. But it's so important to have both aspects of this. They're really two sides of the same coin. Right? So there's that old expression in poker, you don't just play the cards, you also play the player. And what these guys did, what Wall Street meant back then, was to play the player. And, and that's something that I think it's, uh, it, it's important for us to remember. So, like I said, Wall Street always knew this and how important it was to create opinion masqueraded as fact. Now, before 2003, the business model was pretty simple, which was that you created these stories, these narratives, this analysis of individual stocks to try to drive investment banking business. Right, so this is on the left, that's Henry Blodgett. He was Merrill Lynch's star analyst. The axe, as you would call him. Uh, Merrill paid him a couple of million dollars, which back in 99 and 2000 was, was uh, good money for a sell-side analyst. And they paid him that sort of money because Henry Blodgett and the puff pieces that he wrote about technology stocks drove enormous amounts of IPO and secondary work for Merrill. That's Frank Quattrone there on the right, ran one of the investment banks, was on the flip side of that equation. That was the model for how Wall Street made money from creating stories up until 2003. What happened? Well, as always happens, somebody wrote a silly email, right? In this case, it was Henry Blodgett saying, oh my God, are you really asking me to, it wasn't pets.com, but it was something like that. Are you really asking me to write a positive story about this dog of a company? Right? He says, okay, I guess I'll do it, right? because they, needed, they wanted the investment banking business. Well, Elliot Spitzer comes in. He's the crusading, uh, he was the U.S. attorney, and he was then the, the, the attorney general for, for New York, and he, he runs a campaign to put the end to this on Wall Street, and he does. So today on the street, you've got the Chinese wall, right, Bet between research and the investment banking business. Uh, the banks, all the big banks paid a... Yeah, it was back when a billion dollars actually meant something, right? They, the, the big banks paid about $5 billion worth of fines. Uh, Henry Blodgett was barred from the securities industry for life. And Frank Quattrone spent about two weeks in prison. Um, but never fear, right? It all works out great for Henry and Frank and not so well for Elliot. What I think today, whether we're talking about politicians or bankers or the management um, is this, right? That markets are too important to be left to investors. There is the, absolutely a concerted effort to shake their fingers at us and to tell us how to think about the economic data that is reported, right? Whether that's economic data about a company. Ooh, pro forma net revenue sales growth. Look here, don't look over here at gap earnings or profits or whether we're talking about unemployment numbers, or whether we're talking about anything to do in terms of the macro economy. It's this constant effort to shake their fingers at us and tell us how to think. All of these factors, right, they are subsumed by this larger issue of what's being taught to you, right? That's, that's, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying that, there, that the notion that there are these eternal fundamental truths about markets and investing, look, do they exist? Yes, they exist. Value investing is a thing. Quality is a thing. But it's not the only thing. And that there are periods of time when narrative uh, dominates anything to do with any of these fundamental factors. And it's why you know, I, I really think it's important to not just to play the cards, which are the fundamentals of a stock or a market, but also to play the players, right? Which is, which is what I'm talking about. You know, the, the bluffs and the betting and the people shaking their finger at you. That is as important, I think, to actually making money for our clients today as understanding the fundamentals. So we're going to be taking a bit of a dive into the South African bond and credit markets from various angles. And here to uh, do so for you is uh, firstly Olga Konstantantos. Konstantantos? Konstantantos, yeah. Konstantantos, I apologize. <laughs> Hold on, that's okay. From uh, Future Growth Asset Management. And then we have Elina Ilkova from Rand Merchant Bank. Mamakete Dijane from Absa Capital. And lastly, Rowan William Short.
from uh, Nani Fund Managers. So uh, to kick off, uh, let's, let's just jump right in. Um, and maybe to kick off, Elena, do you want to just uh, give us a bit of an overview of the South African fixed interest market, uh, both from the sovereign and the credit side, or as you put it, uh, the good, the bad, and the Wigby? Uh, I could, but first, we need a clicker. Know, the, the clicker, yeah, if you can find that there one, would be nice, uh, but I, I just can't leave actually Ben's comments. First to say, I'm a sell side analyst, okay? Um, <laughs> That's not how real life works here, and certainly not in the fixed income market. Because the one thing we never do is try and kind of tell you the good news story, because we are in the fixed income space. So as a result, my fundamental job description says, be a pessimist. Go look for the downside. So when I looked at this graph that Ben repeated twice, the one that's got the SAP 500 going up, you know, quadrupled or five times, I just look at this and go, in my line of business, that's bad news, okay? <laughs> so if you actually look at things in the fixed income market, when that line looks like that, it means the interest rates have gone up. That's not a good thing when it comes to fixed income. So with that in mind, taking you through the pessimistic view, okay, this is the South African bond market. What you're seeing on um, the screen there is just a very high level overview. Of what does the South African fixed income market represent in here? It represents actually a combination of a very large chunk of government debt combined with things that are not issued by government, but they're mostly issued by South African banks, as well as some smaller entities such as our state-owned enterprises. What you see on the left side of this graph is the overall view of the market. We're talking roughly about a trillion, 4.1 trillion rand worth of debt instruments. And if you recall, for those of you who were a while since you wrote the CFA exam and you haven't looked at fixed income since. Basically, it's money that you have to pay back. You borrow money, you have to have it paid back. The amount of instruments of that nature that are currently um, in the South African market is in the region of 4.1 trillion. You can see from the graph that roughly 60% of that is really debt issued by the government. Some of it is in the form of listed bonds. Some of it is in the form of unlisted instruments, mostly treasury bills. If you actually look at our South African listed market, those are the bonds that you basically trade in the JSC, the situation, the split there, is a little bit more heavily weighted towards the South African government. Um, and if you look at the story over time, you'll think normally a fixed income market starts with government, other things join in, like the banks, the corporate sector. What's happened in South Africa over the last, uh, well, say 10 years in particular, the government's actually borrowed a little bit too much. So we're kind of hitting a situation where it's actually more or less maintained the overall percentage of the market that is really, the listed market that's government debt. And, and you can see it's, it's currently around 67%, followed relatively close, well not closely, but followed by a big gap by banks, state-owned enterprises, and then everything else. In this context, it is very clear that one of the big things that is very important for us in South Africa is how the South Africa, the government bond market, which has become lucky or unlucky for us, quite popular with foreign investors. If you actually look at some of the information that we've seen in the past two or three years, foreign investors have become big buyers of South African government bonds. So whenever you have one of these finger-wagging sessions overseas, we see the impact here. And it's not just about South Africa, it's South Africa as part of the bigger global environment. But there are some very specific factors that drive the South African bond market, specifically the government debt. As I think so maybe let's uh, speak about that a, bit, uh, uh, that a little bit. So the public sector is obviously you know, the, the dominant, uh, uh, the more than dominant factor in the South African bond market. Um, and you mentioned quite <coughs> briefly, you know, can they pay back the money or put differently, you know, what are the fiscal considerations? So Mamoketi, maybe talk to uh, the fiscal side of things and whether you know, South Africa can can uh, potentially uh, do a turnaround and, and, and see the same kind of fiscal consolidation like we saw in the 1990s? Um, so, oh, okay. My mic on. so one of the things that I try to ask myself, uh, because we've, we've sort of been here before, we've had the kind of debt levels that we have now before we've had the kind of situation in the state-owned entities that we've had before, and the question was whether we could recreate um, the gains that we had um, in the late 90s um, and into the early 2000s. 
So if you go back to that period, I think um, at our best, our debt to GDP ratio was sitting just north of 20%. Um, which was down from south of 40%, which is sort of where we are now. So I think looking at the revenue and expenditure um, numbers, what is clear, or the first chart that I've got there just shows you how far behind we were in terms of revenue to GDP. So we had some gains that we could make on revenue to GDP just uh, by improving, for instance, um, governance at SARS and how we executed on revenue collections. And I think the argument I'd like to make here is that it'll be much harder to move from what is essentially the global median of best uh, practice countries by another five, um, five percent percentage points. So if you can get your revenue up by five percentage points of um, GDP, you literally eradicate um, your deficit and you increase your spending potential quite dramatically. What we've also managed to do is that post 2008, we've also increased our um, spending to GDP by quite a big margin. Um, and it's going to be very, very difficult to reverse that. So one of the things um, that we, we were discussing at some point with, with somebody else was whether um, you could get yourself out of the current fiscal quagmire by just growing out of it, so by just in increasing GDP out of it. And I think w what has become quite clear is that you probably have to do a little bit more than that. And um, I had a discussion with um, somebody who should know, uh, a policymaker, and he said he thinks that r reducing the deficit is a necessary precondition for getting growth. So you actually have to deal with the deficit head on. And um, by all accounts, revenues are not going to come to your rescue. So you have to do the politically much harder um, um, task of reducing um, expenditure as a percentage of GDP. So that does bring us to our next topic, which is, uh, is a bit more uh, uh, <coughs> difficult to discuss sometimes, I think. But um, so the JSE has a set of very specific listing requirements when you issue listed debt on the markets. Um, however, there's been a number of shortcomings and, and, and a lot of uh, repercussions from that. Uh, but don't you want to talk us a bit more uh, through that and what you've seen, Olga? Yeah. Sure. I mean, the debt listings requirements are not as uh, comprehensive as the equity listings requirements. And why does that matter? It matters because the SOEs don't have listed shares. And so to the extent Imperial or Sunnet Bank issues debt and equity, us investors <coughs> excuse me, on the bond side, can kind of piggyback off the, the disclosures, et cetera, on the, on the equity side, to the extent there is that. But the SOEs don't have that. And so we relied very much on the debt listings requirements for uh, transparency, for disclosure, and for general kind of standards of, of, of yeah, market standards. Um, and those, unfortunately, haven't been there. So let me illustrate it with an example. If you want to be a director of a JSE equity listed company, there's a, a form called Schedule 13 on the equity listings uh, requirements that you as a potential director have to fill in. And they ask you questions like, what is your experience and qualifications? Have you ever been removed from a position of trust? Have you ever been convicted of fraud? Really interrogating a little bit, obviously they're relying on you to be honest in your answers, but interrogating a little bit about your integrity and, and, and your kind of standing and, and ability to be a director and act in a fiduciary capacity um, on behalf of if you want to be a director of a JSE debt listed entity, this is all they ask for, your name. <laughs> That's all they want to know. And so I guess this is a really stark illustration of the, the significant differences between the two. And so the protections that one thinks one has if an instrument is listed is there potentially in the equity market, but that doesn't exist in, in the bond market. Um, and, and I think, I mean, this... This really does, you know, illustrates, I think, some of the problems potentially that we've had in the SOE sector with, you know, the appointments that we've had. That, that, that questioning um, and integrity hasn't, you know, hasn't necessarily been there. You know, also I mentioned it earlier, our access to information is a lot less. So SENS isn't a regular practice. It's how you can have last year when the Umgeni board, Umgeni Water Board is a bond market issuer, when, they, when the water minister fired the entire board. So there's now a company that has borrowed money from your and my pension fund. Um, and they don't have a board, breaching all sorts of acts, PFMA, their own water act, um, companies act, and, and there's no board, and yet when this happens at the end of June, there's no sense notification of it. That would never ever happen um, in, in the equity markets. So um, really what we're looking to try and do is advocate for some changes um, in the bond listing standards, really to raise the standards um, and, and to make the long-term investment decision making that we have to do to make it um, or to make information in, to enable us to do that a little bit easier. 
So I'm skipping through a whole pile of slides. Um, but they are, they are examples around calling a meeting and voting and access to information. And these are the proposals that we are making, certainly together with the CISA, um, for changes to, to the bond market um, or the debt listings requirements. Yeah, let me talk to inflation forecasting. Without doubt, everybody on this podium, yourself included, Melville, understands the importance of inflation as a driver of nominal and inflation linked bonds. The only problem is nobody can forecast South African inflation. And I really do want to separate something out, which I think is a little kind of intellectually questionable that goes on. Whenever inflation is, for, is released, typically the third week of the month, every economist will uh, contact the buy side the day before and say, yeah, we expect 4.6 for tomorrow. Uh, and then it comes out of 4.7 or 4.5, and they say they missed because of this. Well, that's fair enough. But that number is, no, is not a forecast. The event finished three weeks ago, and they had 11 of the 12 data points. So it's not to de denounce at all the importance of inflation. It's just to tell you how difficult it is. Now, as a statistician, I'm not going to tell you people can't forecast inflation without proving it to you. So I have kept <laughs> the inflation forecasts since we got inflation targeting regime in South Africa uh, at the beginning of this millennium. There's the, t there's the target, three to six. To the best of my knowledge, the most generous, i.e. easiest to meet target of all inflation targeting regimes in the world at 300 basis points. Nonetheless, the Saab, who knows much more than anybody on this podium, that's for sure, and has the brake and the accelerator, has really struggled and has only kept it in within 55% of the time. Now, let's take the one-year forecast, which I have pushed to the right, which all economists call leading when it's patently, obviously, lagging. But anyway, <laughs> let's not get into nuances. And that's what I want to know, because in a, as a bond manager, I would love to have some sort of precision of next year's inflation, not last year's as announced three weeks ago, three weeks after the fact. Because I don't think they measure themselves properly, they're blissfully unaware of how bad they are, and therefore give us two-year forecasts as well. And these, this is the, the BER, I think everybody knows the source, that is uh, South Africa's top economists. Let me just stop myself there quickly. Um, is top economists an ox oxymoron? Okay. <laughs> we, we had, I, I had to think about it this morning because it, it, everybody knows the famous uh, oxymoron is military intelligence. But this morning we had Legionet, which has been followed in South Africa by Virgin Active. There's a proper oxymoron. <laughs> <laughs> And so, <laughs> and so to the punchline, guys, now we have 18 years of data. It's not a pretty picture. And it's not because people are dumb. It's just so damn difficult to do. At a minimum, you'd have to have a handle on the oil price, the gold price. Try and forecast those two. So I just want to put it out there. Critical as inflation is for the fixed income markets and equity, it's just damn difficult to do. Thank you. We had, I think, an amazing lineup of both local and international speakers. And if you will allow me, I really would like to give one more round of applause to our speakers. Thank you very much. The second thing goes to our sponsors. We want to thank um, Future Growth, Sasfin, Factset, Thomson Reuters, and APSIP for sponsoring various parts of our conference and for sharing this with all of us. Thank you very much for your generous contributions. My third thanks go to each one of you, the delegates. You know, a conference does not exist without people in the audience, people not just listening to what is being saying, but engaging. And I'm really pleased at the level at which you engage today. I hope you take a lot from this conference and that you'll have food for thought for a long time to come. So thank each one of you for being here today. Mm -hmm.